You're listening to episode number 262. Today, we're talking about the art of pleasure. This is the Made for Living Well podcast, hosted by Alexa Sherm, the place to create a life well lived. Welcome back to this podcast. As always, my name's Alexa, and this is a place where I believe you were made for living well also believe that you were made to enjoy great sex. Now, sex is a big topic and one we've been talking about all summer long on this new podcast series, The Sex Talk, where I share what I believe is all the information you didn't learn in your sex education or wherever you're learning information about sexual wellness and really starting to put the pieces together about the bigger story to recognize it's not just an act, but it's having a true mind-body-soul connection. And in the process, there's a lot of things that we can do to better that, to create a better sexual wellness routine, and really to create more pleasure and enjoyment for life. Now, today on the show, we're going to talk more specifically about the art or the science of pleasure. And understanding this can really start to help break free of maybe some cultural norms Um, and get you to see that your brain is responding differently to different ways you go about trying to seek pleasure. I won't get into it all now because we're gonna get into it in just a couple of minutes, but before we get there, I wanna remind you that you can get the free sexual wellness guide for men and women over at thelivingwell.com. It's absolutely free, just enter your name and email and I will send you that free guide. You can also find more sexual wellness topics, blog posts, resources, and of course, the other podcasts in this series over at thelivingwell.com. Now, of course, whenever we talk about sex, a lot of people associate that with your hormones, which are a big player in your overall wellness. Now, I'm breaking down hormones in a new way inside my latest course, The Five-Day Hormone Reset. If you feel like you're struggling with hormones or maybe you've been struggling for a long time, this course can really help you break free of the traditional approach to hormones and help you experience really lasting results. Again, you can find that at thelivingwell.com and it is for men and women. Now, one more thing before we get to today's show, I do want to thank this series sponsor, Athletic Greens, for just being here and supporting the podcast. I hope you also go and support them. They are one of my favorite companies as they offer a whole foods approach to getting a lot of nutrient in your everyday life. Now, we know that our food system is void of a lot of necessary nutrients, and even if you're eating a whole well-rounded diet, our nutritional needs are going to change over the course of seasons, your different cycles, and just life happenings. And one way to ensure that you're getting everything your body needs is to take something like the AG1 Greens, which was created by Athletic Greens. Now, I love these greens. I don't take them every single day, but they are very valuable in my everyday life as I fill in the gaps, taking it with breakfast or as a snack, something that I can do that just really satisfies the deepest parts of my body and gives me lasting energy. I'm not gonna lie, I do feel very different from taking athletic greens. And I also feel just this release of inflammation as my body has the energy to support every biological function inside my system. I wrote more about my 60 day challenge that I took with athletic greens, taking a snapshot of my macronutrient count pre and post athletic greens. And I'm sharing all the results over at thelivingwell.com. But you can also find more information at athleticgreens.com. And because you're a listener of the show, they wanted to give you a free gift. That means with every purchase of athletic greens, you will get five free travel packs plus a year long supply of vitamin D. You can get that at athleticgreens.com backslash made for living. Again, that's athleticgreens.com backslash made for living. Okay, now let's get right to today's show and talk about pleasure. Now, pleasure is an interesting concept because I think there's this mixed notion that pleasure is bad, but pleasure is enjoyable and it's so good. And where should we fall morally, culturally? Like, where do we fall on this idea of pleasure? Now, pleasure technically inside the human body is actually a need. It's a driver of our life. And a life void of pleasure is ultimately going to always create a seeking of pleasure, oftentimes an artificial or damaging source of pleasure. 
Now, I know I'm coming in striking big, but I really do want to be clear that pleasure is really truly a necessity inside of our body. It is actually something that was created in us for our own good. Now, yes, we abuse pleasure like we can abuse any other thing, but just because we abuse it doesn't mean it in itself is a bad thing. And pleasure actually is a really good thing for our body. In fact, pleasure is actually this mind-body-soul connection that drives us or encourages us to take action. Pleasure is very similar to what people would call cravings or desire, and the act of pleasure is actually what triggers desire and cravings. It's what stirs something inside of us, desire and cravings, and then gets us to take action to equate to the pleasure that we want to experience. Now, pleasure is a driving force, it's an action, meaning it was really designed for survival. Because a lot of the things that we find pleasure in, like sex, like food, like finding shelter and uh, supporting ourselves, that's all going to come from our need for survival. So what we often associate with pleasurable activities are actually this drive for survival. Now, of course, that can get taken to the extreme, and we're going to talk all about that today, but really underlying all of it, the act of pleasure was to get us to engage and to continue engaging with with acts that are going to help support our bodies and keep us alive, not to mention to continue with the human species, right? So we need reproduction in order for the human species to continue. Therefore, reproduction is a very pleasurable experience. And they found this not just in humans, but in other animals. In fact, most animals actually have a clitoris and also other nerve endings on both male and female species that is going to ignite pleasure centers inside the brain. It's maybe not an emotional connection for other species, but it definitely is a a pleasurable one because again, pleasure drives us into action. And what's so fascinating about pleasure to me is that pleasure actually creates memory centers inside of our brain, and what we find pleasurable are often the things that we'll continuously come back to. So if we need to eat for our survival, food has become pleasurable for the stance that your body knows food is pleasurable, and it's automatically going to turn back to that in time of need. When it's looking for pleasure, when it's seeking something, it remembers where it found pleasure. Now, that's really important to note, and the fact that if you're struggling with pleasure or you're struggling with addiction even, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on, you have to understand that your body has created memories based on the action that you take that created a pleasurable experience, even if it's no longer pleasurable. But because it once did, we often go back to those same things. The same goes for food, and this podcast, yes, is in the sex series, but it goes along with every other act of pleasure that we have, and we know that food is pleasurable. It should be pleasurable because it's the pleasure that drives us to consume more food, which is necessary and needed inside the body. There's an interesting study uh, that James Clear outlines inside of his book, Atomic Habits, that explains the drive or the need for pleasure and creating more action inside of us. He talks about a study done by James Olds and Peter Milner, who ran an experiment that revealed the neurological processes behind cravings and desires. They did this by implementing electrodes into the brains of rats, and the researchers blocked the release of dopamine, which we're going to learn is one of the critical neurotransmitters needed for the reward centers. And to the surprise of scientists, when they block the release of dopamine, when they block the reward centers, the rats lost their will to live. They wouldn't eat. They wouldn't have sex. They didn't crave anything. And within a few days, the animals died of thirst. In follow-up studies, other scientists also inhibited the dopamine-releasing parts of the brain, again, those reward centers, but this time they squirted little droplets of sugar into the mouths of the dopamine-depleted rats. So essentially, they took away the reward centers, but still gave them something that used to, and always, stimulates a reward center, sugar, inside their mouths. Their faces lit up with pleasurable grins from the tasty substance. Even though dopamine was blocked, they liked this sugar just as much as before. They just didn't want it anymore. And the ability to experience pleasure remained, but without dopamine, desire died. 
And without desire, action stopped. So you can kind of see from that is that reward is necessary and pleasure is necessary in creating this reward loop that drives us into action. And when we really dive into the brain anatomy of this, which we're going to do in a minute, you're going to see that really it's our drive for pleasure and the reward centers of our brain that are going to create the most action in our life. So what we find rewards in, even if those things aren't healthy, are the things that we're always going to come back to because it's our reward centers that are driving our life, showing how important it is to understand how to find pleasure in positive ways and also not to suppress pleasure because eventually your body will always recalibrate to find pleasure. So really what we're looking for in this whole picture is to understand how do we balance the pleasure centers of our brain? Because we know it's in the extreme lifestyle, whether we deplete ourselves of pleasure and live a life void of it, or whether we're indulging in unhealthy forms of pleasure that are going to cause the most problems and issues in our life. And the same goes for if we want to change, if we want to create a more positive experience or outcome on our lives, we have to be able to use the pleasure centers of our brain. We have to know how we can create pleasure or be excited about the pleasure of the mundane in order to drive us forward in these healthy lifestyle practices. Now, I hope I'm not talking in circles. We're going to break all of this down, but I just really want to be clear. Pleasure is necessary and needed. Can that be used in unhealthy ways? Absolutely. Now, oftentimes, even when we look at a spiritual nature, it's not the act of pleasure that's bad. It's the way that we create or cause pleasure to become a God in our life. It's the way that we worship pleasure or we use pleasure to worship God. There's a difference, right? And it it seems so small or they seem so close together that we can miss it, but they're two totally different things. One is basically saying pleasure is not the outcome that we seek. It's the means of living the life to seek something greater. Like health, you know, we often like to associate these things, these things that we think will bring us satisfaction, like achieving health or achieving a state of pleasure. Those things in them themselves don't actually create the satisfaction. They just create the drive to continue. And it's, showing that it's not the outcome that you need, but it's how do you create pleasure in your everyday life? How do you use this to motivate you to continue moving forward? Now, I'm speaking in really big general terms because I want you to understand this from a health basis, but we're also going to get into the sexuality of this to show how our body and our brain are responding very differently when we make pleasure the goal versus we use pleasure to better our life and to move us forward. Our brain actually is responding differently to that. And what is going to be incredibly satisfying or to help you create a more satisfying life and deeper connections And what is actually going to leave you more unsatisfied, which is going to leave you depleted in dopamine, longing for more of it. It's basically going to put you on a mission to find a bigger rush of dopamine. And unfortunately, the world has done a really good job of training us for more of these extreme stimulus, right? Like if you look around at the world, we have become really accustomed to creating bigger, bigger, bigger dopamine rushes, right? Like think about even the gaming industry. Like gaming um, used to be playing board games, right? And that used to provide a reward. It was fun, it was pleasant, but now board games aren't as stimulating to the reward centers as video games are. So now we've kind of moved away from these board games into the online space because there's brighter colors, there's more action, it happens at a faster pace. And in time, this releases a bigger reward inside your brain. Therefore, it drives you to need more of the bigger reward. The same thing's happening in the food industry, and food scientists are really great at this. Their job is to create a more pleasurable experience because food scientists know that the more pleasure you experience, the more likely you are to run back to it and to need it. Not just like it, but you start to create a need for it. So think about 
some of the foods today, right? Basically anything in a package, in a can, in a bag, all of those foods have been custom created to give you the most rewarding feeling or experience. So like chips, it's their job to make them perfectly crunchy and salty and really to ignite your pleasure centers. Same thing for pop is like, does it have the right amount of fizz or does a candy bar have the right amount of sugar? All of these things are to process through to make them super enticing because the more enticing it is or the more it excites your body, the more likely you are to come back faster and needing more. So like think about it compared to a salad, right? Like if you're gonna have a bag of chips versus a salad, you probably know that if you just ate salad over the time, you're going to basically wear down your excitatory mechanisms. Like it's not going to cause the same desire to continue eating as a bag of chips. Eventually you're gonna get bored of it and you're probably gonna stop eating it. Where a bag of chips is, you can eat a lot of them, maybe even override all of your hunger signals simply because man, they taste really good. And this is the power of pleasure. It can override biological satisfaction and need, again, proving it's not just producing satisfaction. In fact, pleasure really never produces satisfaction. It's correlated with satisfaction, just like it's correlated with happiness, but it's not the creator of it. Pleasure is really what moves us and drives us forward. Yarlap is the sponsor of the summer series, and I love this company and the work they are doing to normalize healthy pelvic floor tone and helping women realistically achieve that. For so long, we've normalized the opposite of a healthy pelvic floor, making women feel like incontinence is just a way of life. But it doesn't have to be that way, and I wanted to ask Mary Ellen why she is so passionate about this product and why she created it. The quality of life of having that tone pelvic floor of not worrying about going to the gym or the trampoline or anywhere, it's not unachievable and you don't have to suck it up or live with it. It's not a chapter quote um, of motherhood that you have to live with. It is something that you can easily take into your hands and change if you have the right tools and you have the right education about what's going on with this muscle group, what's going on with your anatomy. And if the Yarlap is a good tool for you to have, we would be absolutely thrilled to help you in your journey. But I think that the key is giving everybody the correct tools and education to make the right decision. And I think a question that so many people wonder is how long does it actually take to work? Usually you start seeing results anywhere between two to 12 weeks, depending on the tone of your pelvic floor muscles. We can't neglect the fact that the pelvic floor is linked to every other function inside of your body. It's not the separated system, but it's part of the whole of who you are and healthifying your pelvic floor healthifies so many other systems. I highly encourage you to check out Yarlap for yourself at thelivingwell.com backslash Yarlap. And if you have questions or on the fence, contact their customer support. They're amazing, and they would be more than happy to help you out. Also, don't forget, if you're interested in your own personal device, use the code LIVINGWELL for $25 off. So what you don't find pleasure in, you generally stop quickly, or maybe you don't even come back to it. So take, for instance, maybe that workout that you've wanted to establish in your life, um, and you know, it's just not pleasurable, right? Like you hate it on some level and you question yourself, like you think it's just an act of willpower or maybe if you just try harder, but you can't figure out for the life of you why you can't get up and get your workout done. And really it's because you've allowed it to become such a a negative experience or maybe you haven't learned how to make it pleasurable enough that your body has no drive for it. And what's not pleasurable, our body doesn't drive forward. This has happened in our sexual world as well, right? With the notion that women are not wanting sex as much as they should, or maybe as much as they were created for. As we've learned, we understand that a woman's libido is actually in many ways stronger than a man's. But the question is, why don't they want it as often as a man? 
in some cases, I think that they do. And sometimes there's a hormonal cycle. But I think another piece of the puzzle is, is that women have been void of the pleasure associated with sexual intimacy. And when there's no pleasure, there's no desire. Yes, you can do it sometimes, um, but over the course of time, your desire and your craving for it is going to be diminished or maybe even non-existent, not because it's not there, but because you've never experienced the pleasurable reward or the satisfaction that comes with it. And I think part of that is because women haven't been given the opportunity as often as men, to find pleasure and reward inside sexual intercourse. But as we know, that's why I think women are designed to receive, to receive the pleasure, and men find more pleasure in actually giving than experiencing or being given to. Um, And I think that's so cool that we were created in that way because it just shows that in order for us to have healthy sexual intimacy, we really need to understand that it takes pleasure and we're all capable of pleasure, but we have to use that or we have to create that pleasure in our life and not just expect it to come. Again, pleasure is not just an outcome and living for pleasure to be the outcome is going to greatly change how much satisfaction you actually experience. Because pleasure is not the satisfactory point of anything in life, but it's really life itself. It's really the purpose of life more than it is the outcome or the action that you're trying to achieve here. So before we get into how pleasure is affecting our brain, I do want to bring to light a few myths around pleasure. One is that pleasure is not objective. In fact, pleasure is very subjective. Meaning the definition of pleasure or what is included as a pleasurable experience is going to be significantly different from person to person. And the reason for this is regardless of how the brain processes pleasure, because anytime you experience pleasure, your brain is going to process it in a similar fashion. But what's pleasurable to someone To me versus someone else, it's going to vary based on experience. It's going to be very based on memories, the environment, your mind. All of these factors are going to change your rate of pleasure. It's also going to change whether you've learned how to create pleasure or learned how to foster pleasure or whether you've suppressed pleasure for so long, right? So pleasure truly is subjective. But what I think is so interesting about pleasure is that pleasure actually has the ability to change or our mindset or our ability to feel pleasure can change over the course of time. So pleasure is also not always the same. It's not fixed, but it can evolve. In fact, people can experience more pleasure from mundane things than they can a lot of extreme things, but this is a learned trait. Which means you can learn to experience healthy pleasure, more satisfactory pleasure, and the deeper places where pleasure was intended. Not these surface level extreme external stimuli that cause you to go on this kind of roller coaster ride, just like sugar does inside of our body. So, pleasure is not always the same, but you can experience more pleasure by learning how to experience more pleasure. And this isn't just for your mindset or your psychology, but there's actually a bodily connection. And they've learned this, research shows this through people who've become a paraplegic or maybe lost, you know, functioning in parts of their body or even feeling in parts of their body that were pleasurable, like genitals. They have learned that you can actually retrain your body to experience the same pleasure that your genitals would experience in other places of your body. That's why some people have been known to orgasm um, with different stimuli of kissing the neck or even reading a book, sneezing. There's a lot of different ways people can experience the same pleasure of sexual intercourse or um, sexual intimacy in other parts of the body, which I'm not saying is something that we all need to strive for, but it does show that you have the ability to change how your body feels pleasure. It's not just what happens to you, but it's what you create based on the action and the lifestyle you live. This is what's so cool about the human body is it's not stuck no matter where you are 
I think we're all a little bit closer than we know to really experiencing the fulfillment that the body and these connections and sexual intimacy is supposed to provide. Another myth that I want to break is that pleasure and happiness are the same. It's really not true. Um, Pleasure doesn't provide any more happiness in someone's life. In fact, you can experience pleasure without any happiness at all. In fact, a lot of addicts do this where they take the hit of something, whether it's um, an addiction to porn or an addiction to alcohol or an addiction to a drug, and that might create a rewarding experience, at least temporarily, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're happier people. In fact, we know that people who live in these, what they would consider external stimulus of pleasure or these superficial pleasure sources are more unhappy, depressed, lonely, and isolated. So I really want you to get away from this idea that pleasure is going to create more happiness in your life. They're correlated, but it doesn't cause it. In fact, it's quite the opposite. If you're more happy, you're more likely to experience more pleasure. So looking at it that way, again, might change your desire or might change what you crave and desire. I mean, you can look at this the same way with health, right? Like if you create more health in your life, more than likely healthy behavior is going to create more rewards. It's going to create more pleasure. If you're trying to use pleasure to achieve health, by maybe suppressing pleasure to get there. Like I'm going to beat my body into submission. I'm going to do this workout even though I hate it. I'm going to eat this kale salad even though it's disgusting. You're really never going to get yourself to that place. Likewise, it's more than likely going to flip the switch that says like I've done all the right things. I give up. And then it leads your body on a binge or a bender to find pleasure and all the things that you've been trying to avoid. That's because our brain is really, really, really powerful. And I think if we start to switch the narrative that health can create pleasure or happiness can create pleasure, rather than using pleasure to achieve a destination, we're going to start to shift our idea or maybe even walk away from some of these damaging extremes that we've experienced pleasure in. Right When you start to realize, I want happiness more than I want pleasure, and I know in my happiness, I'm going to create more pleasure, then maybe the chips aren't quite as satisfying. Because it's not that the chips aren't satisfying or rewarding, but it's that your first priority is that you're already starting to find some reward and just the simple act of believing that you're capable of getting healthy. It's the same thing with sexual intimacy, right? Like when we think the outcome or the orgasm is what's required for us to have a healthy sexual routine, it leaves you with a lot of insecurity and it leaves you doing a lot of drastic measure to try and quickly or efficiently or whatever reach the end, to reach the O. But there's a lot of reward and the buildup of that. There's uh, even more satisfaction in the process of intimacy. It's not necessarily the act, but it's the connection. And when you find the reward and the connection, yes, you can enjoy the act, but the entire process becomes rewarding, not just the orgasm. And that changes the game because then it makes it less likely to indulge in behaviors that are actually creating more harm in the body like looking at pornography just to get off quickly, and it makes you drive or it makes you um, desire the actual physical connection that is more satisfying with another human being versus just alone with your phone or the computer screen. Yes, there is an intense reward with looking at pornography and having an orgasm, But when that is the only focus, you are going to become more lonely, more depressed, more um, unsatisfied than actually shifting the narrative. So we have to go back and understand again, it's not that pleasure is going to give you the outcome you're looking for, but pleasure is an outcome of already living in the things that you're looking for. Pleasure is the outcome of health. It's the outcome of happiness. It's the outcome of healthy sexual connections. It's not the reason for those things. And the last myth that I want to break is pleasure is always good. I kind of mentioned this before, but no, pleasure is not always a good thing. It might feel like a good thing, 
but too much of a good thing can actually turn into a bad thing. And this is where we actually start to see the role of addictions. Most addictions happen not because people just pick up a trait and they just run with it, right? Addictions happen because there it does, even if it's not a good thing, it triggers a reward inside your brain. And the bigger the reward, the more likely you are to come back to it again and again and again. So when we start to see external stimulus, right, like these external sources that are maybe um, what some would call hyper-stimulated pleasure or super normal stimuli, these are things like pornography, like chips, like desserts, like the perfectly photoshopped image on that magazine cover. Those are all really desirable things not because they actually are desirable, but because they produce this like hyper stimula inside of your brain that causes this massive spike in dopamine that is unnatural to other normal stimulus that are natural. It's like, for instance, like taking caffeine, right? Or needing your energy drink to make it through the day. The caffeine levels inside of those drinks are not natural to the body. It's creating this quick spike or this quick rush inside the system, which becomes really addictive because it feels really good no matter how momentarily it is, but then it crashes because inside of our body or anywhere, Newton's third law or the law of balance states that for every reaction, there is an opposite and equal reaction. So the higher you spike, the lower you're going to fall. And the lower you're going to fall is going to push you into a place where you actually are going to start needing another spike. So sometimes we see in pleasure is that what starts out as pleasure turns into a need of survival. And that's how we know how addiction arrives, right? Is it might have started out as a pleasurable experience, but because that pleasure turned into higher highs, it also created lower lows. And no longer are you doing it because you like it but you're doing it because you need it. You need it to survive another day. You need it to fall asleep at night. You just need it. And it doesn't even mean you like it anymore. And that's what's so hard about this is because it can be a really good thing, but if we're not careful with what we're finding pleasure in, we can totally destroy our pleasure centers, hijacking all free will for the sake of another dopamine hit. And again, the food industry, the beauty industry, the porn industry have all been so great at creating these unnatural experiences that excite the body in unnatural and unhealthy ways that leave you coming back to consume them again. But in the long run, it's completely sabotaging the entire scope of your mental health, but also your biological health as well. And there's true biological implications to unnatural, excitatory pleasure centers. When they get all rewired and out of circuit, um, it's really going to cause an, a complete change in the overall functioning of your body based on the nervous system response. Now, the good news is this can change, right? Like your brain and your body have the ability to be rewired. And I think that change happens for all of us is when we recognize pleasure is meant to be enjoyed. And what we find pleasure in is going to create the outcome of our life. Now, we can find pleasure in most things if we choose to, right? Pleasure is more of a choice than anything else. Yes, we can find pleasure in things that we don't want to find pleasure in. But again, it's what we choose or our perspective of how we choose to react to those things. So I think the big key is, like, how can we find more pleasure and our life and these healthy ways to create a better life, but because we're living out of a better life. We're going to dive into that at the end, but I really do want to get into the brain centers because I think it's so fascinating when you understand how our brain works and its drive for reward is so strong. And these reward centers are what's creating the entire cascade of hormones, of neurotransmitters, really how our body is living out of them. Essentially what happens inside the body is whenever you start to get a desire or a craving for something, your brain chemistry is going to start to change, releasing dopamine and adrenaline to start fixating on the thing that you want. So pleasure doesn't just happen when you reach 
the destination, when you take the hit, it is actually happening in the anticipation of the hit. There's some really fascinating research about this that shows that our brain is actually wired for wanting more than it is for liking. So there's great pleasure and the anticipation of achieving something or of getting something even more than it is liking. So these wanting centers of the brain are considered like really large parts of the brain. It's the brain stem, it's the amygdala, it's the prefrontal cortex. There's a lot of really big areas of the brain that are responsible for wanting. Now, the liking centers, the actual what happens after you achieve that or get that or participate in something, the liking centers are much smaller and are distributed more like, some would say, tiny islands throughout the brain. They are not taking up big parts of the brain, but they're kind of just scattered throughout. And researchers have found that 100% of the nucleus accumbens is activated during wanting. Meanwhile, only 10% of the structure is activated during liking. So your body has a deep desire or drive. It's going to reward you for these cravings. That's really where it's getting a lot of its fix and why sometimes the anticipation of something, like the anticipation for Christmas Day, might even be more pleasurable than the actual Christmas Day. Or being excited about the vacation might actually turn out to be more likable than the vacation itself. I'm not saying that necessarily one is better than the other, but sometimes it's the anticipation, it's the desire that's so enticing and so excitatory inside of our body that it's actually creating a bigger reward than the act itself. Now, part of that is because we have to get ourselves to act. And without reward centers, we don't take action, just like the rats or the mice that died when they lost all desire, right? It's the desire that keeps us moving in life. We have to have desire to continue moving forward. Now, what you desire is going to change how you take action. But I think it's really interesting to note that your desire is going to activate more of your brain than any sort of liking. And so we need to pay attention to what we're desiring. But when we desire something in anticipation, our brain again starts to release these neurotransmitters. It's going to start to shift our hormones, just communicate with our body to pay attention to the thing that we want and to take action in order to get it. Now, when you actually do the thing that your body's craving, then it's going to spike your dopamine levels and it's going to spike some other hormones inside of your body like serotonin that are going to create that feel-good response, that response that happens that makes you say like, ah, that felt really, really good. Now, when we do this in unhealthy patterns or we excite this or hijack these centers, when we spike dopamine to unhealthy or abnormal levels, that spike in dopamine is going to feel really, really good, but it's generally pretty short-lived and it's going to fall down in the opposite direction to the same degree it spiked. So you're not only are going to have higher highs, but you're going to have lower lows. You're going to feel really great, but you're also going to feel really horrible. And generally, when you feel really horrible, that's the time when your body starts to crave and desire something that's going to make you feel good again, because our body loves to feel good. And so it's going to lead you or make you desire and crave something that's going to feel good again, and it's going to spike it again. And the bigger you spike it, the more your body becomes accustomed to that spike and the less likely mundane things are to feel good. Now, we can see this in the porn industry, and we can see it really well in the porn industry, because what porn does is it takes away the connection, which is going to be really critical in sexual health and sexual wellness, which takes away a lot of the insecurities, which makes pleasure more easy to achieve. Anxiety, worry, uh, insecurity hijack our pleasure centers that make it really hard to achieve pleasure, Um, and that's just a good thing to note. Not to mention, it takes away our ability to be fertile because of the way the nervous system is responding. But generally when people are looking at pornography, um, they don't have the insecurities that they have with another human or maybe they're faced with, which makes it easier to achieve that reward. Now, because it's a super stimulus, meaning it's a very artificial, right? Most pornography is spliced together images that are so uh, um, impossible to actually achieve in reality. So it excites it in a new way. And it's going to spike it. 
But generally that spike is short-lived. People crash. They might feel guilty or shameful or just feel like blah, like that didn't really do what I was looking for. But my body and my brain now remember that I found pleasure in porn. So what's going to happen is when you drop to the low, you're going to seek out the, the best way to achieve a new pleasure. And the best last way that you achieve pleasure was maybe porn. So your body's going to go back to porn. You're going to get that spike and then you're going to drop. This is why porn addiction is, is massive. You know, some of these porn sites, I think Pornhub has received about 11.8 billion hits on Pornhub. 11.8 billion hits, astonishing, right? And it's because of the drive for pleasure, because people have been void of actually experiencing pleasure in everyday life. We've kind of gone off the rails to the extreme, and it makes it feel impossible for people to find pleasure in anything but porn. This is why porn is a leading cause of erectile dysfunction, of a lack of connection, a lack of pleasure, all because it hijacks the pleasure centers. The more you do it, the less pleasure you're going to get, the more you're going to look for pleasure, so the more often you're going to run to porn, and eventually you're not really going to find satisfaction in it anymore. You don't like it, but you need it, and there's where the addiction lies. Now, I'm not saying that everyone gets addicted to porn, but it is easily addictive, just like foods are, um, just like uh, chasing beauty can be, uh, because they're not natural. And what a lot of these things don't give you was actually going to create more satisfaction, and the pleasure that most people is looking for is actually the connection aspect. And the difference between pleasure and external stimuli that are really superficial and exciting the, or hijacking the reward center is that those processes or that way the body responds to pleasure is going to be void of the connection aspect that's going to prolong the length of pleasure that you experience. So when someone looks at porn, right, and they experience this quick reward, that reward actually fades. Some people would say within minutes after um, after it's over or even hours, you know, and really hours would be a long time. But what happens with reward or pleasure when you're actually connecting with other people or connecting spiritually um, in these transcendent pleasure uh, experiences is that it's prolonged meaning a sexual encounter with someone that you love or having intimacy based in love and you find pleasure in the love aspect, not just the act, that's going to start to release prolactin. It's going to start to release oxytocin. It's this connection aspect and it's the prolactin and the oxytocin that's combined with the dopamine that spreads out the pleasure over the course of hours, even days. I mean, if we go back to the research, the research of pleasure shows that pleasure in connection with oxytocin and prolactin is going to be longer lasting significantly, even tenfold to that of pleasure experienced in isolation. That's why some people consider pleasure to be expanded when shared is that it's not just the act of releasing dopamine, but it's the act of releasing the oxytocin and the prolactin that makes us connect with other people, with the world around us, with our, um, with our spirituality, our soul. It's this connection that really creates the satisfying form of pleasure that people are looking for. And I think that's so cool because in a world that is so isolated and it's so easy to sit behind a computer and it's so easy to sit here and podcast to you without ever physically touching someone else and without that release or without that connection, we're really not releasing what it is that's going to continue to drive us forward in these healthy practices. So all that to say is there is a huge difference in pleasure and isolation and pleasure and connection. Pleasure and connection releases more happiness, it releases more satisfaction, and it really truly is a more pleasurable experience when we measure pleasure on a scale versus pleasure and isolation. It doesn't necessarily matter the the spike of dopamine. Initially, you might find it. Those first few hits are really um, intoxicating. It's ecstasy. But over time, you almost numb out to it. And it's not the intoxicating nature that connecting with someone else is. I think I want to say all of that is to show that pleasure is to be enjoyed, but pleasure is to be enjoyed in community and connection. 
that doesn't just mean that you um, can have as many partners as you want in the bedroom or it's not that because when sex is an act that you do outside of love, it is not nearly as satisfying or pleasurable as in connection birthed in love. I think that's why some um, people would say what people are really looking for in sexual intimacy and where they're really finding pleasure, again, is not the orgasm. It's not the act. It's actually in the connection. And it's the connection to life that's going to create the most pleasure. Because at the root of it, our will to survive and finding shelter and finding security and finding food and, and reproducing is only as good as our will to belong, to be seen, and to be known. Those are still greater because you can have all the food in the world, you can have shelter, but without connection, what purpose is there? I also wanted to take a moment to talk about Athletic Greens, who I'm so honored was willing to sponsor this summer podcast series. Honestly, over six months ago, I took on a little adventure or a quiet experiment of trying Athletic Greens for myself. I'll be honest, I was a little leery of the hype behind it, thinking it was just a really well-branded product that a lot of people had picked up, but was it actually going to do anything for my body? Now, previously, about three or four years ago, I had been highly invested in another greens formula that had gotten bought out by another company, changed the formula and the quality, but after it was over, I really did miss the greens but I hadn't found anything that I liked up until Athletic Greens. It caught my eye, so I took it on a little experiment, and honestly, I was kind of shocked by the results. I found through a micronutrient test that it increased my total micronutrient level inside my body, as well as boosted my energy and decreased my hunger and cravings. I mean, it really was truly astonishing. And it's something now I'm six months later, my experiment was only supposed to last 60 days, but six months later, I haven't stopped because I really do find so many benefits and love the way it makes me feel. Now you should try it out for yourself. Do the little experiment. I'm not saying it's for everyone, but how do we know unless we try it? It's one of those broad spectrum foundational supplements that's easily digested and absorbed inside this powdery drink that you can take at any point throughout your day. Of course, it's ideal in the morning, but one scoop a day can really change your overall health. I love it. I think you're going to love it. And that's why I reached out to Athletic Greens to be a sponsor on the summer series, because I want you to try it out. And knowing it's not just for your energy or your immune support, but this is what's going to help your sexual health as well. So make sure you check that out at athleticgreens.com backslash living well. And if you try it out, they're going to give you a free year supply of vitamin D as well as five free travel packs. So make sure you check them out after today's show. I know we could argue this stuff all day long, but I really do want to make it clear that you were intended to experience pleasure. Pleasure is necessary. It's, It's a gift to be enjoyed. And when you start to pay attention to where am I finding pleasure in my life? How can I make sexual intimacy more pleasurable? Because pleasure excites our body. It releases a flood of oxytocin and prolactin, which is going to help manage our nervous system response. It's going to make us less stressed. It's going to reduce anxiety. In fact, we know that pleasure and connection, it increases our pain threshold by a thousand times. Um, And so it's really going to change the overall health of our body in a positive way. Outside of the connection aspect, like when we're just attempting pleasure from pornography, we're actually going to see a rise in in testosterone issues, a rise in um, heart disease, a rise in anxiety, depression. I mean, a lot of issues that many people experience. And really, again, it just shows the difference. And it's not just the release of certain things to create a quick feeling. It's the connection of the mind, body, and soul. It's the connection of all of it. And it's the healthifying of the body and more of an even release, not a quick spike. And it's in that, that you find more satisfaction. And when you find more satisfaction, you have cravings and desire to continue to experience that same thing. So I think I wanted to say all of this today is that I feel like statistically speaking, a lot of people don't find 
pleasure in sexual health um, or in sex in general. And I just want to be clear that pleasure is intended. It's a gift. It's a design for the human species. But pleasure can be abused. And when we abuse pleasure, it actually has a negative effect. Just like all good things can be abused and turn bad, right? Like sleep is great, but too much sleep can actually be a detriment to your health. So too much of a good thing can be bad. It's really learning how can I foster this in my life to create a healthier, happier, more fulfilled life. And it starts by understanding one, where am I finding pleasure? If you're not finding pleasure, you have to know that in our suppression of pleasure, we'll often look for it or find it most often in unhealthy ways. So the more you try to suppress pleasure and say like, I don't deserve pleasure, there's no time for pleasure. Like we see this in people who work a lot, um, don't take breaks, they suppress pleasure, suppress pleasure, and then all of a sudden they go to the extreme to find pleasure. Maybe that means they have to get wasted on the weekend or they have to cheat on their, their spouse. They have to do something more extreme because they've been living too extreme. Extremes always balance each other out. But what happens when we start to find pleasure in the everyday? Not to create a happier, healthier life, but because of it. Like what happens when you decide, okay, the way I've been experiencing pleasure is not suited where I want to go in my life. And as long as I let it, it will continue to be the outcome I experience. How can I instead foster a healthier life by experiencing pleasure and healthier things? This is a choice. And this is really where change happens. So when we look at sexual wellness, like we know that it's the connection with someone else. How can I foster healthier connection? How can I foster more love to increase my desire for the connection aspect, knowing it's the connection that's going to create more pleasure in my sexual life or with food, right? Or health, right? It's like knowing, yes, ice cream is pleasurable, but it's really not lasting pleasure. How can I create more pleasure in going on a walk after work? How can I find pleasure in the foods that I eat? How can I enjoy the process? And maybe it's not even in the foods that I eat, but it's in the process of how can I find and experience the pleasure of feeling good because I took action in a positive way. It's attaching pleasure to the things that you want to experience and trying to detach the pleasure from the things that are actually harming you. So maybe if you're struggling with pornography, we know that there is no benefit to pornography in the human species. In fact, it's causing a lot of harm. If you want to do any research, you can look it up and look at the effects of porn on the brain and how this is completely changing how people interact with each other. But looking that up and recognizing, okay, I might struggle with porn. A lot of people do. It's addictive. It's intoxicating, right? Just like any other substance is because it's creating a reward center doesn't make you a bad person. We have to know that it's these processes that are hijacking our own body and our own will for the next dopamine hit. So you do it again. You might hit that dopamine hit, but start to pay attention to how does it actually make you feel? Maybe it makes you feel isolated and lonely and guilty and shameful. Start to focus on that instead of the reward. And in time, your body will start to associate some of the things you don't want to continue to do, but haven't been able to stop yourself with, with not as rewarding as they used to be. And in the process of that, you also have to start doing more rewarding behavior. You have to start craving and desiring things that actually can bring you pleasure and move you forward in a healthy direction. Maybe for you, that's like, I'm going to put more desire into connecting with my spouse, or I'm going to find more pleasure in finding a workout that works for me or in a diet that works for me or finding pleasure in the way that I have more energy, finding pleasure in the way that I sleep better, like starting to be rewarded based off the things that you are feeling that are positive and the things that you want to continue. And the the things that you want in life, you have to attach or celebrate a reward. It is the only way to keep yourself doing it over the long haul. Because if it's not desirable, you have no need to continue. Without pleasure and satisfaction, you will not sustain it. These are important and critical elements in human biology. Even if they aren't things that you necessarily feel like are necessary, they absolutely are. Your body is constantly working off of reward loops. The question is, what are you finding your reward in? Sexually, what are you finding your reward in? 
Is it actually creating the action and the satisfaction that you're looking for? Or could you foster something healthier? And even if you're not sexually active, right? It's it's knowing that we all sexual human beings and our sexuality can be channeled in a direction of connection and creativity, even curiosity. But where are we being creative? Where are we being curious? Where are we connecting? And is that creating a healthy reward and a direction that we want to continue to go? I know this is a lot, but the reward centers are really, really powerful. And our drive for sexual intimacy is really strong because it's a survival mechanism of the human species. We were made to reproduce. And we shouldn't deny it. But there is a right way to treat our sexual desire and an unhealthy way. And I fear, based on the statistics, that more people are traveling into an unhealthy direction that are creating unnatural stimulus in the body that are just wrecking havoc. And sometimes it's leading people into behaviors that they don't like, but they can't get themselves out of because now they've created a need. I'm here to tell you, and hopefully this podcast shows you, you can rewire all of that, but it's shifting your attention away from the quick reward of this behavior and onto a reward that's more sustaining, it's more natural. And I think we can do this in a lot of little ways, right? We might struggle with big things sexually or lust or um, pornography or, you know, some people struggle more with food or um, an unhealthy lifestyle. Don't look at it so much in these big ways as maybe starting with how can I find more joy and experience more rewards and the little things that I do, the things that I completely overpass every single day and my need and my drive for these big rewards. Like how do I find simple pleasures? Because it's it's simple pleasures that we can start to attach to the reward that we can find in our everyday life that are going to diminish the need for the bigger reward. We just need more simple pleasures in our life. Maybe it's your morning cup of coffee. Maybe it's stepping outside in the sunshine. Maybe it's the compliment someone gave you. Maybe it's the music that you listen to. Maybe it's the way someone hugged you. Or maybe it's you hugging someone else. There's a lot of pleasure that comes from giving and meditation and being in connection or having a soul connection to um, your religion or spirituality. Like There's tons and tons of pleasure that come from non-sexual things. And the more we can experience pleasure in these non-sexual things, the more we'll find pleasure in the sexual things if we channel it in that direction, knowing you are created for pleasure. Pleasure is good, but there is a difference between healthy pleasure and unhealthy pleasure. And I think sexually we have been hurt by pleasure or the pleasure of other people, which has diminished all pleasure in our own life. And that makes me really sad. (laughs) Here's the deal. Pleasure creates energy and connection and a drive to live a more fulfilling life if that pleasure is done in a healthy and natural way. So the question is, how can you create more simple pleasures in your life? And also when it comes to sex, you are made to enjoy that. You are created to enjoy the pleasure of it. It is a pleasurable experience for both sexes. So if you're a female and you're not experiencing pleasure, you need to ask yourself, why can't I enjoy this? What has stopped me from enjoying the act of sexual intimacy? And if you're a male, you need to ask the same questions because you equally struggle with this conversation as well. And if you're finding pleasure in unhealthy or unnatural sources like pornography, I think it's time to start understanding, is that actually as pleasurable as I've made it out to be? And do I want to continue? Like, is this healthy for me? And also start to distinguish that not all sex acts are actually as pleasurable as people have made them out to believe, as culture has told you they are, and maybe as you felt they were in the beginning. There is a difference between natural and unnatural pleasure, and we really need to get back to the natural pleasure to create more satisfaction and fulfillment in life. So here's my last thing that I want to say. Remember, Men tend to find way more pleasure in the act of giving, and women find more pleasure in the act of receiving. Our culture has totally mixed that up, making it feel like it's a woman's job to give and a man's job to receive. And I think part of the unsatisfaction and part of our drive to look outside of 
intimate relationships for that pleasure is stemmed from this mixed up view that is actually devoid of the pleasure people are looking for. So if we twist that view and recognize that men, you're probably going to find more pleasure in pleasuring the female species and females, you're going to find more pleasure in just receiving that, right? Like you're going to find pleasure in taking that. And that's our intended design. Yes, it feels backwards. I know it sounds backwards, but truly pleasure is to be experienced in a healthy form. It is the intended design and a necessity of life. It's how we use it. So my question is, how are you experiencing pleasure? Is it healthy? Is it driving you forward in an action that helps you or is it hurting you? And in that case, you know, you can do something about it. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this episode on pleasure. I'm gonna be talking more about this over in the show notes at thelivingwell.com. Don't forget to check out all the sponsors of today's podcast, Yarlap and Athletic Greens. They're amazing. And I'm gonna be doing some giveaways at Instagram at Made for Living Well for some free product to try out for yourself. And if you want more help, don't forget, go back and listen to all the podcasts in this series. I hope you're loving them. We only have a couple more to wrap up this series, including one very special guest that took me a long time to convince to come on the show. I'm not even sure how thrilled he is, but we're going to get him on the show. My husband is coming on to talk about our real life experiences and maybe some mistakes that I've made along the way in this series. Okay, that's it for today. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast at thelivingwell.com backslash review and share it with your friends and family. I know that's a little awkward when we're in the sex talk. I don't blame you, but maybe go back and share a different episode previously before the sex talk. If you're really not in the game of saying like, hey, listen to this talk all about sex. That's what's on my mind. It's awkward. I get it. You don't have to do that, but you can share a previous episode or just leave me a message and let me know what you're loving about the show. Okay, next week we'll be back on talking more about men's health and then we'll have the last interview with my husband, Peyton, coming on the show in a couple weeks. In the meantime, here's to experiencing more pleasure, creating it in a healthy way. I'll see you next week.